Yes, folks, I think it's time for New Zealand and Australia to really start rethinking using nuclear power, uh, especially in Australia. They have the ideal conditions for nuclear power. They have a large land mass, of which a lot of the land is pretty much unusable anyway. And of course, they have an abundance of uranium. Anyway, Michael Schellenberger, a renowned uh, environmentalist uh, who used to be uh, pro-wind and solar, has now turned away from that and, and is going towards nu nuclear power. Have a look. Well, back in this country, the Green New Deal, almost overnight it seems like, has taken over the environmental agenda of the Democratic Party. Young pioneer Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says, we're going to need to ground our planes, ditch our cars, stop having kids for the sake of the planet. We even need to stop eating hamburgers, though Ocasio-Cortez's chief of staff was just caught downing one for dinner the other night. But even if we went entirely to wind and solar, as the Green New Deal ordains, would that fix the problems we need to fix? Michael Schellenberger has spent many years looking at this, and he doesn't think so. He's the president of the group Environmental Progress, and he joins us tonight. Michael, thanks very much for coming on. Thanks you, for having me. You wrote a piece in Quillet this morning that I thought was really smart and interesting, and I recommend it to everyone watching because of the level of scientific detail in it. But it's about wind and solar, and the claim that we could shift the grid to rely on renewables like wind and solar overnight and be okay. And you say that's not possible. Yeah, we, you know, and I was one of the founders of sort of the original Green New Deal back in 2000, between 2003, 2007. People don't remember uh, President Obama. We spent about $150 billion on renewables between 2009 and 2015. And we just in kept encountering the same kind of problems everywhere that were related both to the, the essential unreliability of solar and wind. They just depend on when the sun is shining and wind is blowing, which is 10 to 40 percent of the year. And then also something that people are not as aware of, which is the low energy density of sunlight and wind. And basically yes. what we've been finding is that the, the lower the energy density of the fuel, in this case the sunlight and wind, the bigger the environmental impact, you just have to use a lot more natural resource, including land, to generate very much electricity. Yeah, so in other words, um, to power uh, the entire United States with um, solar energy or solar power would require about 21,000 square miles of land. Have a look. This is the amount of, now this is the whole United States, and this is the amount of land required would, that would re, be required, which is about a quarter of the size of Arizona. So it's not very good for the environment, was your point. Then you point to another form of energy that has a checkered reputation, but that you made a very powerful case for, nuclear. Yeah, I mean, we were in the, in the process of, of trying to figure out how to deal with things like climate change, or even if you're not as concerned about climate change, how to deal with air pollution. Yes. We finally just had a number of friends who said, what about nuclear? And we were like, well, but nuclear is scary. And we had, you know, I had all of the concerns that most people have about nuclear. I went up and read up about all the accidents um, and was shocked, actually, by how few people uh, died in Chernobyl. Um, in the most recent accident in Fukushima, uh, the scientists agree that nobody will die from the radiation that escaped. And that too is explained by the energy density. So what we find is that biomass, burning wood and fossil fuels kill about 7 million people a year from smoke. Um, and so that smoke is just a function of all of that waste product being in the air, people breathing right. it. With nuclear, even in the worst accident, only a tiny amount of material escapes. And so the energy density of the fuel also determines just how much air pollution there's going to be. So the people who wrote the Green New Deal and proposals like it must have consulted scientists before they did. And so they must know what you just said is true because it, it demonstrably is true. So why isn't, so. <laughs> why isn't nuclear part of the solution? Why are they against nuclear? It's very disappointing. Um, well, I mean, there's sort of three big reasons why people are against nuclear. I mean, the first is that they associate it with the bomb, which right. is wrong. They're two separate technologies. Um, you know, the second is that in the 60s, more in the 60s, but still around today, there was concerns that too much cheap energy, too much nuclear energy, would result in overpopulation, overconsumption. And then the third one, which in some ways is the most powerful, 
is just a really strong desire to right. use energy to harmonize with the natural world, that turns out to be a bad idea because the more the more natural resource we use, the worse it is for the natural environment. Well, exactly. You know, we exactly. Yeah, now folks, contrast that American environmentalist we've just seen with some New Zealand politicians debating climate change at a recent climate uh, conference in Wellington recently. But be warned, folks, you may need a vomit bucket. ...say the Greens Party is voting to leave and wanting to actually make New Zealand green again. The Greens Party is voting to leave and wanting to actually make New Zealand a better emitter. Um, would actually try and use science to help us reduce our emissions. <laughs> Does the Act Party have a policy on GE using or genetic modification? Well, that would, would get rid of our GE free laws that we currently have, which stop us actually um, planting genetically modified sperm. You go down the American, the American route. Yeah, okay. So. <laughs> That's where New Zealand's comparative advantage is going to be. And yes, we also need to diversify the economy because the Americans have gone down the open slather genetic modification route, which I don't personally agree with. We are currently completely not using any genetic uh, technology at all. Now, there's a new technology that's developed in the last six years called gene editing, just like selective breeding. So just like what we've done with cows, and chickens and dogs for the past 5,000 years, we can now do the same thing a hell of a lot faster and a hell of a lot more cheaply. And if we are going to meet some of the environmental challenges that we've got coming down the pipeline, fresh water and climate change, we are going to need to use some technology. And we think gene editing is the middle ground. At the moment, we have forestry as part of our emissions trading scheme and not agriculture. Now, why should you give a shit about that? Why? Because New Zealand is not going to take action on climate change in your lifetime with the emissions trading scheme as it currently is. Okay, I want to get through a lot of questions, so I'm not going to give a big political speech in response to your question, uh, so I do want to hear you guys. Right, so dairy is 5% of New Zealand's GDP. It's not actually that much, it's dairy sector. Okay, 20% of exports. So it is true that, you know, once you put a price on carbon, um, like uh, so I'm an economist, just in case uh, you wonder prices in the world. And by the way, a capital gains tax excluding the family home, half of our assets in New Zealand are the family home. No successful economy in the world invests that much in housing and land. That's why we call it our, most of our great exporters are, are land-based industries, right? Because we have this incentive to invest in land and property. Tax is number one. I've never actually tried land growing meat myself. Has anyone here actually tried it? Yeah. You have? What is it like? Is it good? It's good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think there's always going to be uh, in terms of, what are we actually talking about? Everyone's like, we had housing and... <laughs> <laughs> How do we transition? Um, we need to change the way that we look at our economy. Uh, moving away from GDP as the pedestal deified measure of success. Um, because it's cooked, it externalises uh, costs in terms of the environment and people's well-being. Uh, the work that we're doing in terms of moving towards the well-being budget is a good start. But again, we need... Those of you, there was an election in Australia yesterday, you probably all know, and the people who got the Scott Morrison... Tommy Abbott's gone. Well, <laughs> ...about climate change. So actually, it's going to be your generation that's going to need to do this. Now, coming back to the original question around farming, um, history never stops. Um, the Thames, some of you will have been to London. If you haven't, you will go. We've got old Kiwi OE, you'll end up one day standing on the tent. That was a basically, it was a dead river one time. There was no fish in it. Absolutely no fish. I'm going to stop it right there, folks. I can't take any more of that. Yes, folks, you've just witnessed our future. A very sad future indeed. 
Now, folks, I've just posted a, uh, a link to the rest of that comedy show for the, uh, in, the, in the description below. Uh, for those who are interested or those who can stomach that nonsense. Anyway, I've posted that below for you.